So our next session will be a plenary session, uh, which uh, will be led by uh, Mr. Adam Gern from FAO. But before I, I uh, pass the uh, floor to, to Adam, I would like to uh, say some kind of protocol for, for all of us, uh, how we conduct this uh, webinar in the rest of, of the hour uh, we have this afternoon. Uh, especially for, for the audience, uh, all participants are requested to keep their audio and video muted to avoid any interference uh, at the background. So please uh, help us to, to improve or make the quality of this conversation better by, by doing that. And if you have any questions, please use the chat uh, feature or chat box if it is only a comment, put a C in your chat, but the rest will be treated as questions or concerns that you have. This will be safe uh, by the host to capture your, your questions. Uh, for those who are speaking in Bahasa and you have difficulties in conveying your message or concern, please do type in Bahasa Indonesia. We will, we will capture that and certainly we'll address them. Don't worry. In the breakout session, we will have four uh, rooms, as I said earlier, and that will last for one hour each. And participants who have been um, choosing their uh, preference to be, um, you will be assigned to the room you are interested in uh, following your registration. This session is recorded and uh, by, um, Doing that, uh, all the presentation and conversation uh, will be well captured and will be posted in our website a uh, few days later. And for panelists and discussion, I would like to emphasize a number of things. One is about the moderation process. So we are expected to be punctual in you know uh, all the sessions so that we can have the uh, breakout group effectively and going back to the plenary session timely. So please, uh, with the help of the host, uh, you will be reminded from time to time about your deliberation. The time slot is one hour for the breakout, but it will be very uh, quick and fast if you have a very active people, that's what we are expecting. So make sure we, we don't offer uh, time for the uh, breakout session. The panelists are requested to mute their microphone after they have spoken. So again, this is for the sake of the quality. And then for panelists and discussion, we again would like to have you back in the debriefing room so that we can make a, a quick a kind of evaluation and perhaps uh, accommodate your suggestion about the way forward. This is very important while the iron is hot. So please uh, come back to the uh, briefing room. So that's all I have to uh, announce. And without further ado, uh, Adam, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Pak Daniel and C4 as the main organizers of this session. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Please confirm. Very well. Good. Thank you. So firstly, everybody, please join me and welcome our plenary speakers today. We have three distinguished experts who will share their knowledge and their perspectives on criteria and indicators for peatland restoration. We have heard in previous sessions that the criteria and indicators should have a balanced approach. They should cover all four aspects of peatland restoration, not only the biophysical, but also consider the social, economic and the governance aspects. I won't go into those points. That's the job of our expert speakers. But please allow me to add one UN perspective and a global dimension to our discussions today in introduction. So I'd like to plant the seed in your fertile minds 
to grow some ideas on how these peatland criteria and indicators can be included in the wider global agenda for the sustainable development goals. Importantly, I ask how we can get these peatlands better recognized in the big long-term push for the UN decade of restoration, ecosystem restoration, which is just starting and will go for 10 years. So please think about how the final conclusions from this event could feed into those global processes. This would really provide a head start to get peatlands noticed and acted on with high level attention and potential future funding. Enough from me, let's get straight into some of those details and hear from our expert speakers. In this session, we'll hear 10 minute presentations from each of the three experts. Our first speaker is Pakbudi Wadana, who is head or deputy head of the Peatland Restoration Agency, Biagaye, and where he is responsible for planning and cooperation. Pakbudi, you have 10 minutes. Please start your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Let me share my presentations. So I was given the uh, title for the presentations uh, process for pitline monitoring and assessment. This is for the session one plenary. So uh, the background, pardon? Is it clear? No, yes, yes, it's okay. Okay. So the uh, for the background, the pitline restorations, uh, when we receive the mandate, to uh, restore the peatland. Actually, the peatland restoration is not uh, conducted in empty landscape. There's already uh, land uses, land management, and uh, uh, activities using the uh, peatland. So when we, when we start the restorations, we have to deal with uh, various stakeholders and land uses different interests, different requirements, approaches, and uh, we have to strategize uh, the effort to restore accordingly. So we take the phase approach and a various restoration strategy is conducted from rewetting, revegetations, and also revitalizations. And also we need uh, to have the uh, restorations going on on the ground and it uh, requires the governance system at the uh, village level so that we develop uh, the program we call Disapaduli uh, Gambut. So different approaches and strategies might require uh, different indicators. That's that what we discuss for the four uh, series on the uh, criteria and indicators. And also different approach on monitoring and assessment of those criteria. Uh, moreover, the, the, the regulations on peatland area of peatland degradations according to the peatland ecosystem functions. There's uh, ecosystem functions for protections, ecosystem functions for uh, enable for the cultivations. So we need also to uh, to strategize our approach in the restorations. Uh, taking into account uh, the degradation criteria that uh, already been uh, enacted in the government regulations. So for us, indicators are useful to measure progress over time, uh, and then uh, also provide information relevant to the restoration measures. The indicators are also useful to measure the project impacts, outcome, output, and input and that are monitored during project implementations, also to assess progress towards uh, project objectives. And also identify areas that uh, requires increased attention by any relevant stakeholders. So we should facilitate the, uh, the, uh, the need of stakeholders for the uh, better conditions of the peatland. And also because we use the indicators to evaluate the uh, impact of our restorations, the indicators should be monitored. For us, there are still challenges in monitoring methods and assessment, include the cost, 
for the uh, method for the monitoring, the time, the ease of use of any method, reliability and efficacy, the efficiency for adjustment and corrective actions, the effectiveness uh, for adjustment and corrective action. So uh, one of the uh, main message that I would like uh, to convey to you all is the use of the uh, remote sensing technology. With the help of uh, FAO, we do the analysis and modeling of groundwater level from a soil uh, moisture map. And combined with the uh, on-field uh, measurement equipment, we try to uh, make a process of what it is modeled from the uh, soil map to indicate uh, the uh, probability of uh, the field groundwater level would be. So we use the SIPALAGA as the verifications of the model that we built together with FAO. It is the indications, the first indications that we use to uh, measure the progress in terms of biophysics, especially on the uh, hydrology of the peatland. The other part of the aspect of uh, peatland uh, monitoring, peatland indicators, is the need to develop a governance system, uh, improve the governance at the uh, village level. As I mentioned uh, before, we do the program to empowerment the community group and village government with the program called Desa Peduli Gambut. This Desa Peduli Gambut and combined with the revitalization of the economy of local community might result in changes on management and allocations of land, including pit land, and thus uh, have direct positive impact to support restorations and sometimes to help the further degradations for monitoring the impact of DPG, uh, we use the index Desa Membangun that was uh, that is uh, developed by the Kementerian Pembangunan Desa and Daerah Tertinggal, what it is in English. Uh, Daniel will explain it later. And then adjust this IDM, the index Desa Membangun, accordingly for villages on peatlands. That's uh, mostly on the economic social aspect and also the environment aspect of uh, index Sambangun. So at a glance, you can see that uh, in the PRIMS Gambut, the monitoring platform that we have, we call it PRIMS, Pitland Restoration and Information uh, System, we call it PRIMS. And uh, we can see in this that on the uh, villages that already have a program called Desa Peduli Gambut, the, the red dot, which uh, indicate the hotspot, are less compared to the uh, other area that not have the TPG. So why don't uh, we do all the villages that has peatland uh, the similar uh, TPG, Desa Peduli Gambut, the 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 most uh, uh, the most reason for not having all these these uh, these villages having the DPG is uh, of course uh, it's a classic uh, reason is on the funding. So you can see all that this Peduli Gambut is not only implemented through uh, APBN but also uh, Mitra or partners of uh, BRG, such as Kemitraan, they have also helped us in developing the TPG. And also uh, the private sector. Private sector has their own program. Actually, they adopt the TPG program for BRG and uh, we sign the MOU for uh, having those uh, program developed together. So BRG provide the uh, the uh, materials provide the expert and also provide the supervisions of the uh, TPG that was implemented through the private sector's uh, involvement. So the other uh, issues that we discuss is uh, the economic aspect of uh, criteria and indicators that 
our main aim actually is to transform the business model on uh, peatlands so that might help the further degradations and support restorations while reducing the greenhouse uh, green cows greenhouse gases emissions so it uh, need to be combined the monitoring of the uh, reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions as the cr and the mrv for the emission reductions we use the general economic models uh, from input process and then output and then we uh, we we analysis uh, further the pit restorations in which uh, as a special case the environment aspect of the peatlands will uh, be the main platform of all the social and the economy so we use the inputs of peatland ecosystem as the services as the provisioning services regulating and so on and so forth and then the process that we uh, put there to uh, to improve or to restore the ecosystem services through reverting mm -hmm. revegetation of degraded peatland and the expected output that we should uh, also monitor as in peat uh, degradation halted so we need to to show that all the uh, activity it is relating to the review will in the avoided, avoided emissions from fire and decomposition avoided flood and loss of land mass and so on and so forth this is just an illustrations that uh, we need to uh, to deal with to uh, see that the income and also the values uh, will be improved although the activities from uh, the from the activities, the business process that damage the peatland economy ecosystem and then uh, transform into uh, non uh, non degrading uh, activities would not undermine the income and value and uh, might be uh, attracted more revenues from the uh, the carbon uh, trade. But uh, we we should have the uh, carbon trade uh, regulation soon. So, in concluding remarks, the restoration of degraded peatlands take decades to recover. So, we need a long-term, comprehensive, and continuous monitoring, equipped with the scientifically uh, robust uh, criteria and indicator. And we should also consider the progressive indicators as the uh, keynote from uh, Pa Nasir. It is imperative also to continue the exchange of knowledge through the interactive discussions on scientific ways to use criteria and indicator approach towards monitoring and evaluations of uh, peatland restorations that we face. Because uh, the dynamic of the pressures of our peatland and also the growing demand on proper peatland management as part of the climate change mitigations uh, uh, aspect, climate mitigation effort. The monitoring approach and also the advancement of the remote sensing technology is uh, growing, but still some indicators requires data from the field level. So uh, this is the, the, um, the method of monitoring and then uh, the choosing of the appropriate indicators for a certain criteria will be, will be uh, important for them. BRG will greatly uh, benefit from the development of the principles, criteria, and indicator for biophysical, social, economic, and governance, uh, governance attribute, providing synthesis in the context of ongoing restorations and identify possible step of verification uh, process. Thus, uh, important for us especially uh, if the uh, president uh, give us the second terms of uh, our uh, deliberation for the uh, uh, preservations of peatland the sustainable management of peatland and uh, halting the uh, further degradations of our precious uh, peatland so thank you uh, pa adam uh, Back to you. No, thanks to you, Pak Budi, 
for the uh, for your excellent coverage and sticking nicely to time. I very much appreciate the comments that you made about uh, valuing the input on the criteria and indicators. So this session we hope will be useful for BRG. Gay. Thank you, Pak Budi, and uh, and also to Pat Nazir. Unfortunately, he wasn't here, but I hope you will pass it on to him. We very much value the uh, collaboration with BRG. So let me move on to the next speaker. Our next second speaker is Professor Mark Reed, who works for several uni uh, universities in the UK. He's worked on conducting research and leading programs with sustainable agriculture and ecosystem management. And he's also been working with FAO and UNEP and partners through the Global Peatlands Initiative. So working on developing a set of indicators for sustainable management for peatlands. So without uh, wasting any more time, I'll hand over to Mark. You have 10 minutes and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here again. I'm going to try and take a, a fairly critical approach in this talk uh, at some of the insights that I think have emerged across this webinar series and assess some of the shortcomings of criteria and indicators before considering some of the types of work we might want to prioritise as a community in this area. So to start with, I'm going to take a, a, a critical look at some of the things that we could perhaps do better and suggest uh, four things that could perhaps go wrong. I'm just going to turn off this printer, it's making noises. So uh, first of all, I think it's quite tempting to rely on single indicators or a small set of indicators of a similar of a similar type for example biodiversity uh, climate related or hydrological indicators to realize why this is so dangerous i think we need to remember the uh, definition of a good indicator which is of course a sign or a symptom of something an indicator is a sign pointing us towards the reality that a peat bog is degraded or in good condition it is not reality itself. Uh, of course, you can also think of indicators as symptoms. Uh, so a headache is a symptom of many different types of illnesses. So I don't jump to the conclusion if you tell me that you've got a headache, that you've got meningitis. But uh, if you're sweating and telling me to turn off the lights, uh, then I might well conclude that I should take it to the doctor. Uh, the point is that I am triangulating or checking between these symptoms before I conclude what I think is going on. And of course, it's the same with a peat bog. There could be many reasons why biodiversity indicators, for example, could be declining, including hunting and diffuse pollution that might not be related to the condition of the bog itself. So rather than concluding that I need, that I need to re-wet the bog, I look for the source or causes of the specific issues those indicators point to, rather than inferring any wider issue until I've triangulated my biodiversity indicators with perhaps some climate or hydrological indicators as well. The answer isn't to come up with clever indices that integrate multiple indicators into a single value either, uh, losing all the granular insights that each individual indicator could have given us. What we need is a diversity of indicators collected over time. Uh, and I think it's really important to emphasize the, the time point here. We need time series data if we're going to detect trends in indicators and avoid misinterpreting unusual years and taking action that potentially makes the situation worse. And of course, dry years is the classic problem when everything looks worse in a drought. But of course, nature has a way of recovering. And if we can measure over long enough, we see that indeed that things get better over time. The second issue is reporting indicators without contextual data that we need to interpret that evidence. I've talked about this before uh, earlier in the webinar series and it's a constant source of frustration to researchers who want to compare their research to your monitoring data or to synthesize your work in a meta-analysis. If you didn't report a few basic things like the peak type, location of your site, or its altitude. So others don't know if they're comparing like with like when they read your work. 
Next, I think we need to think carefully about trade-offs between accuracy and ease of use when we are developing indicators. Some of the most accurate and reliable indicators can only be measured by researchers with specialist training and expensive equipment. But that shouldn't stop us developing proxies that could be collected more easily with less resource, enabling citizen science and monitoring by practitioners and agencies that don't have the same resources uh, as researchers. And the other thing that frustrates me about many attempts to monitor indicators is their lack of connection to local communities and to the issues that affect them. While your government and other national and international stakeholders might be most concerned about climatic indicators as they chase their net zero targets, local communities may be more interested in indicators that might tell them whether or not they need to change their management practices to protect the fish they rely on for their livelihoods, for example. If we want communities to get involved with monitoring and benefit from this work, as Budi suggested that we should, then we need to get them involved right at the start when we are identifying indicators. Some of these indicators might only be relevant to one region and they're unlikely to be on the core lists of indicators we would prioritize as researchers or policymakers. But that additional work to collect data on these indicators can make the difference between whether you engage and benefit local communities or not. But if you want to engage local communities, it can and should go beyond just consulting them about what to measure. They may be able to get involved in data collection, in the interpretation of data, and in the management response to the findings of the management work. Too many indicator data sets sit on bookshelves or inform policy without delivering local benefits stakeholders. I believe we need to empower communities to engage more in collecting and interpreting monitoring data so it can be used directly in their own management decisions. This was the focus of my PhD research with local communities in southern Africa. And in this image on the screen you can see communities ranking indicators based on a combination of both local knowledge from interviews and knowledge from the scientific in the, uh, literature. There's a little bit of background noise. I'm not sure if uh, anyone can work out um, uh, where that's coming from and, uh, and it's for me. So uh, the second and final thing I wanted to talk about uh, was uh, the kind of indicators uh, and criteria that might be useful. Uh, now, in medicine, uh, this is a crazy figure, but uh, apparently uh, it's estimated that over 80% of medical research is, uh, I quote, wasted. Uh, and when I say wasted, uh, we're talking here about research that can't be used in evidence syntheses uh, that would ultimately inform evidence-based medical policy or practice. While our monitoring program uh, might uh, answer the questions that we have posed for our specific purpose or context, none of us want to design our work in ways that will prevent it from ever being used by anyone else to inform policy or practice. And the key issue here is that different teams measure and report different indicators in different ways so that the findings can't be compared or synthesized. This is a problem because we know that policy should be based on evidence synthesis, not on individual studies to avoid policy flip flopping as studies reach different conclusions, often for very legitimate reasons, because, uh, as I said, they measure different things over different time horizons, for example. Of course, for all the reasons I've given in this talk, we need a diversity of different indicators and the freedom to measure what we think is important. But we must balance this against the need to synthesize and compare for evidence-based policy and practice. So to enable future synthesis, we need agreement on a set of core indicators that can be measured by the majority of monitoring programs in comparable ways. My colleagues and I, as I described uh, in one of the earlier webinars, are working with UNEP's Global Peatlands Initiative to do just this for tropical and UK peatlands. Uh, the write-up has been delayed, but uh, we are hoping to have a paper that, uh, that many of you uh, who've inputted can comment on by January. 
To conclude, the task of identifying and measuring criteria and indicators to perform peatland restoration, in my opinion, goes way beyond just identifying and measuring indicators. What we measure really matters, but so too does how we collect and interpret our data and what we do with the insights we get from our monitoring. This webinar series has shone a light on some of these issues and will, I hope, enable us to all move forward together to take a far more sophisticated approach to these issues. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, for that uh, very cautionary kind of, uh, some of your cautionary comments on things we need to be aware of when we're considering developing indicators. That's pretty important to keep us grounded in this work as a, appropriate in the plenary session. Thank you. I note we're doing okay for time and I can't promise we will have time for questions, but I see a couple of questions being written in the chat box and I encourage people to start putting them in the chat box and if we have time at the end of this plenary session or sometime during the event today we will try and get to answer those so uh, but at this stage in the proceedings I would like to move on in case our next speaker actually answers some of your questions and I would like to introduce our third speaker Dr Harry Pernomo who works at C4 he conducts research on criteria and indicators of sustainable forest management generally, many other topics, uh, but today he'll be speaking on defining and measuring peatland restoration. So, Pat, Harry, you have uh, 10 minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will share my uh, screen. Um, let me go. So um, I hope you can see my uh, screen, my presentation. So the uh, title of my presentation will be Criteria Indicators for Defining and Measuring Pitland Restoration. Plenary, myself, uh, Harry Purnomo, working at C4 as well as at the uh, IPB University. So uh, first, as the uh, CNI, criteria indicator CNI said, it's useful for not only measuring, but also defining what good pitland restoration is. And also, uh, as pa, uh, Budi mentioned, elaborating the pitland restoration concept, sometimes quite, quite uh, abstract to more uh, practical, as well as uh, assessing, measuring, and monitoring the process and progress. And also the CNI is useful for communicating and reporting the status and the condition. So if you restore your, your pit land in one place, how to, to communicate. And CNI is very, very useful for, for doing that. This is the uh, picture of when we, uh, with Paharis, when we launch our book, on the uh, uh, learning from the ground on the pitland restoration. And why I mentioned that CNI said able to define pitland restoration because we know uh, what principle to embed in the pitland restoration, the principle with the good, the fundamental truth, and also understanding and sharing what a good pitland restoration is. Yeah? Also aware how the world will perceive your restoration effort. It's, it's a way to understand each other, a way to communicate your, your work on the pitland restoration. So this this is what we call CNI structure that we uh, did uh, in the sustainable forest management. So the structure is a hierarchy, as you see. There's a goal for overall pit, restor pit land restoration. And the structure of uh, PCIV, principal criteria, indicator, and verifier, that embraces the aspect of, as Daniel mentioned, environment, economy, social, and governance. 
So we have a goal, principle, criteria, indicator, and some verifier. Principle is fundamental truth for proposition that serve as a foundation or system of belief or behavior for a change of reasoning. So it is a fundamental truth. And then underneath you have a criteria used to assess judge with compliance with the principle and also an indicator that able to indicate the status of criteria and those must be minimum and localized to meet the context and also very important to uh, able to make use the collected collected uh, existing indicator of verify there it is there's already this opportunity come how to make use of uh, of existing uh, indicators there this is the structure and also uh, from our password password there is nine uh, point to determine the suitability of CNI is adapted from Prabhu et al. 99, relevance, related logically to the assessment goal, and also precisely, precisely defined, diagnostically specific, easy to detect, record, and also interpret. Interpretation is important, Real, reliable, and also adequate response to range to changes in level of stress on the pitland governance, ecological, economical, and social system. So indicator must be uh, uh, quite sensitive to change. Also uh, provide a summary or integrative measure over space and over time for BRG, for instance, able to conclude at the provincial level or national level. Also appeal to user who are going to to use the uh, the criteria indicator, and then the verification procedure must be cost effective. It's not very very expensive, cost effective, and also quick, simple, and understandable. So understanding the the difference between input, process, output, outcome, and impact base. Yeah? With the indicators, indicator of input or indicator outcome, they are equally uh, uh, valid. Uh, FSC, for instance, mostly based on the indicator outcome, but ISO, ISO is mostly based on the indicator input yeah, and process. Yeah. Also transparent and possible in order to be acceptable. So need to be transparent, and this need to be tested. Yeah. We cannot hypothesize all indicators from here. You have to hypothesize some indicators then test it on the ground. Also, the, the difference between generic for Indonesia level, for instance, and also localized CNI, as my creators uh, uh, already underlined this. Generic means for the whole group or, or similar things, not specific to any site but then can be modified and customized to comply with local condition. For instance, condition in Bungkales is different uh, from Papua, should be different indicator of verifier. FSC for a stewardship concern usually only defined principle and criteria, but indicator is nationally defined or more uh, sub-nationally defined. Yes, the generic one is adaptable to all types of tropical peatland situation. And as an operational, as a mother set, it's like a mother that you can uh, derive more locally relevant specific uh, CNI. And what C4 develop uh, software called a CMAT, criteria indicators, modification and adaptation to. So we have generic one and go to a specific um, Pitland uh, hydrological unit, and then how to uh, to adapt and modify with, of course, with uh, local stakeholders there, yeah. and to meet the local interest. Something like probably want to restore, but at the same time want to develop uh, alternative livelihood there. Just from our work in in Bengkalis Ria, and 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 then after you develop a uh, CNI. Also important to do assessment and monitoring. We did in 
past years in using multi-criteria analysis technique to score the goal. So we uh, integrate indicator-indicator into criteria then into principle. And finally, we can, uh, we can uh, agree what the overall score of the goal is. Having clear standard, norm, and knowledge, what whether it's more modern, scientific, or passive knowledge, also as a representativeness in terms of uh, scoring, assessing, be aware that even sustainability is locally and culturally defined, as Margaret mentioned. Also transparent, and the assessment can be part of the evaluation, sometimes for judging, but it is very important for adaptive co-management, learning for improvement. If you are not good in certain kind of indicator, then how you uh, you understand and then improve it. This is the uh, quite important for for improvement. And the key messages the last my last slide. CNI is a way to define, assess, monitor, and communicate. Communication is important. Pitlan restoration effort. CNI can be structured hierarchically as a PCI free and needs to be logical, simple, and reliable among others, and understandable, understand the whether it is generic, and also localized, and localized to be relevant with local context. And also uh, it's important to understand assessing CNI in particular site for improvement, learning for improvement, also integration eh, cross time and also uh, spatial scale. Okay, that's all what I can share with you uh, guys today. Thank you, uh, Adam, back to you. Thanks, Pak Harry and all of our speakers uh, from from my side, that's been uh, a very broad, but also getting into the details of some of the measurement of those indicators. Uh, so all of them, all of you three have contributed excellent uh, presentations. I'm also noting some very good questions in the chat box. And in fact, even more impressive, I'm seeing some answers from the community. So I encourage you, if you haven't got uh, if you haven't read the chat box yet, please look at the chat box. There is some excellent uh, questions and also some answers from this peatland community we have established on this webinar and some links to websites or papers, field examples uh, from others like Yesaya, which is fantastic. So please look at that. I actually looked and considered that many of the questions were kind of half answered in the chat. So in the interest of time, I will hand back to Rupesh to lead us into the next session. But if anybody feels they have not been an, uh, properly answered, please let us know in one of the other breakout groups. You will have an opportunity for input there. But we are well on time and I think we should continue to, uh, to the next session. But thanking our final speaker, thanking our speakers again, and I hand back to Rupesh. Thanks very much.